Hello, I'm Mike Sherwood Smith, uh, speaking to you from Edinburgh in Scotland, and um, uh, about to talk to you about the cognitive effects of bilingualism. This talk uh, will be divided into two, and it will be um, an interpretation uh, of the research on cognitive effects uh, within the framework that we call the MCF, that's the Modular Cognition Framework that has been developed by myself and John Truscott uh, over the last 20 years. So, let's start. Um, two important concepts um, are cognition and language. And by cognition, I include both uh, consciously available and subconsciously available knowledge. Um, the subconscious uh, subconscious activity uh, is by far the greatest part of our mental processing uh, with conscious activity uh, only at, at a tip of the iceberg uh, so uh, this is an all-encompassing view of knowledge stored in the mind and brain and language uh, uh, an even uh, vaguer concept uh, which can be defined in various different ways uh, so requires a definition from me. So language is a system that humans have evolved for formulating and communicating thought. Why formulating and communicating, uh, since it's often called a system of communication, but uh, as human beings have other ways of communicating without language, uh, we have to include formulating. And some people believe that formulating part is the most important. So, let's have a look at the way uh, we are going to develop this talk. Uh, well, part one uh, will be mainly taken up with uh, preliminaries. Um, the first one being uh, talking a little about the modular cognition framework, the MCF, and uh, two ways of studying cognition, two basic ways of studying cognition. Um, I can't possibly give you a complete uh, story about the MCF, but you can find these on um, on our website under multimedia, um, uh, uh, that's the cognitionframework.com, and um, there are introductory and less introductory talks which go into the details of the framework. But I will give you a, a, a general idea of what it's about uh, in this first preliminary section. The next one will be simply to establish what we mean by multilingualism and bilingualism, and thirdly. Um, the main topic of today and uh, part one um, and also part two, uh, cognitive effects, what do we actually mean by that? And then I will start uh, on the next major section which will be called the hidden homunculus which is a rather mysterious title perhaps for some of you uh, but I will explain all when we get there. Okay, let's now begin with the first preliminary uh, discussion and that will be on the modular cognition framework which I'll simply call the MCF from now on or the framework. Okay so uh, cognition um, uh, can be studied in two main major ways. One is uh, as something that the mind possesses uh, and secondly as something that the physical brain possesses. That's the, uh, the mass of uh, meat, you might say, in between our ears, uh, residing in our head, the physical part. Um, these two are, of course, uh, associated intimately, uh, but um, describing them and talking about them requires a quite different approach. So, like the brain, the mind is a network of cognitive systems, that at least they have in common. Um, but uh, how is it manifested in the mind and the brain? Unlike equivalent systems in the brain, systems in the mind can be described in relatively simple terms. In other words, uh, at a more abstract level. Um, uh, when you see some of the uh, displays that I'm going to show you in, especially in the second part, you may begin to wonder whether it's all that simple. So I better warn you, it's a relatively matter. A relative matter. It doesn't mean that it's simple but relatively simple or less complicated. 
Describing the equivalent physical systems in the brain uh, require a very different approach. I mean, when you're talking about a neural system, a physical neural system, you have to talk about different locations in the brain, you have to talk about different pathways, uh, different units, and you have to talk about different types of operation, different operating system. So it's a very different kettle of fish when you're talking about the physical brain. Uh, this is an extraordinarily simplified picture of just the visual system. And since there are many cognitive systems um, uh, whereby we gain a special kind of knowledge, in this case uh, a visual cognition, visual knowledge, um, you can imagine that multiplying these on one screen would be extremely difficult, uh, especially as this, uh, this is a very simplified one. Um, there are the eyes, by these circles are the eyes, by there. this is the optic nerve, splits up. Um, so uh, you'll see what I mean then. So uh, let's focus on the mind, because uh, that is what the MCF is about. Now the mind, um, since we're talking uh, in more abstract terms, um, and we're not talking about the physical system, but as it were, the software. People don't like the software-hardware analogy, but it's quite useful if you don't take it too literally. Of course, the mind is not a digital computer. So uh, we have a sort of system. And um, you may have noticed the red circle that I put around mind, and it may remind some of you of the London Underground. That is uh, a deliberate um, effect I have created, because um, um, the London Underground, of course, uh, can be described in different ways. It can be described um, in all its uh, physical detail. Uh, but I can tell you that if you walked into, um, um, I don't know, King's Cross uh, Underground Station um, in order to try and find your way to, uh, let's say, Earl's Court in London, um, and you were uh, faced with a, a picture which showed you all the physical detail, the, the, the the tunnels, how they actually are, uh, and the, the rails, how they wind in, in various ways through the city, um, at various levels, um, etc. The electrical system all mapped out for you. Uh, that will be no use at all. You'll be completely flummoxed. But what you do get is an equivalent rather to um, a picture of the mind, a plan of the mind. You get uh, just an abstract, uh, stylized uh, version of it. Um, with the stations as simple circles here. Um, and um, using this, you can uh, voyage your w around the whole system quite easily, uh, and it's very user friendly. So, uh, the mind. Okay. Well, uh, according to the modular cognition framework, which is based on, let's say, the, uh, uh, a majority uh, of views on the cognitive system from research uh, within cognitive science um, uh, consists of five outer cognitive systems, uh, well we call them outer, um, and, and uh, they form an outer circle uh, because uh, you might say if that is the periphery uh, of our mind map, uh, outside is the outside world, it's our portal to the outside world, it's the the, the, the closest we get to interacting with the physical outside world, which comes to us as raw sensory input. And these five systems respond more or less to the traditional five senses. So here we have the auditory system, um, here we have the somatosensory system, that's not a traditional system, but it, it replaces what is traditionally called touch, but this is a much more complex sense. Uh, so I, I'm going to call it body sense. Um, and we have the visual system down here, and we have the gustatory system, the taste system here, and the olfactory, the smell system here. So um, depending on what type of stimuli we get, uh, this, is, uh, this leads to the creation of uh, these five types of knowledge, which uh, is how we humans represent the systems uh, the, the kind of information uh, that uh, we, we sense we make of what's coming in through our different senses. 
and uh, two of these of course are important for language processing and uh, uh, it, it doesn't take much uh, skill to to work out which they are. There's the auditory system um, whereby we we hear uh, spoken communication coming to us uh, and um, language communication and the visual system which copes of course with uh, written text and indeed uh, sign language. So these are the two ones we'll be concentrating on and all, though all of them are involved in language we're going to leave that aside for the moment. Okay so the auditory system is up here and it uh, consists of, uh, this is what it looks like and I'll explain that in a minute and the visual system is down here. These are the ones we're going to look at. And you may ask yourself, what are these circles and what are these squares? Well, we don't have circles and squares in our physical brain, of course, but in the mind we can uh, treat them uh, in an abstract, more abstract sense. So the circles uh, uh, represent the processing system that each of these five cognitive systems have. Um, so it's the processor, if you like and it builds knowledge from the input it gets and it uh, activates the knowledge that uh, is already uh, created and in its uh, particular uh, bank, if you like, store. Um, knowledge, of course, uh, is in the form of representations. And the store is where the representations are and that's represented uh, by the squares. So this, this, this is where this, the knowledge is created. This is where the knowledge um, can be activated uh, whenever it's needed. Uh, so uh, in order not to complicate uh, the slide even more, I'm going to remove the processors. So we'll talk only in terms of the stores. And when we talk in terms of the stores, I hope uh, you will uh, take the process apart for granted. Now these uh, systems the, that in this outer circle, this perceptual uh, portal, if you will, like, uh, are richly interconnected. So um, one of the characteristics of um, uh, this perceptual group of systems is uh, that they're always very highly active um, and um, they're richly interconnected. So um, a representation is in one will typically um, uh, co-activate other representations which have been associated with it. Um, and since we need the system for negotiating our way through the world, uh, with through uh, well the, the outside environment especially, uh, avoiding threats and being attracted to things uh, that we should be attracted to or are attracted to, um, it's, um, this is most of the time this is active and probably uh, even when we're asleep to some extent it's all um, bubbling away. Now uh, let's add in uh, the so-called inner cognitive systems uh, because um, uh, take uh, for example the visual system here. Uh, in here we have uh, visual representations. Uh, the vast majority uh, will have been accumulated over the lifetime that you've um, had so far and these visual representations um, um, will be sitting sitting there um, and uh, th they will be uh, activated um, when necessary, right? Um, uh, however, none of those representations in this particular store or indeed in any of the other stores so far have any meaning. They are meaningless. So we may be aware of them for example, we may be aware of something visually present, but we have no means of um, knowing uh, what it signifies, what meaning it might have. And another thing we don't have is uh, how to value it, how to assess its importance. Is it a, a positive thing or is it a negative thing? Is it something we should avoid or if it's, if, is it something that we should not avoid? Um, for this we need a deeper level of processing, that's the inner system. And um, one of the most important ones is the conceptual system. The conceptual system is a system which um, um, stores meaning representations, if you like, conceptual structures, we call it in the framework, 
and uh, they, there it is, there's a store sitting there in the middle and notice it's connected to all the systems that we were talking about before, the sensory perceptual system. So, um, uh, for example, a smell, um, a smell representation, um, uh, part of our olfactory knowledge, uh, uh, will have a meaning, uh, a meaning for us, right? A significance for us, as will something we have seen and stored as a visual representation or an auditory representation, and so on and so forth. So this is the meaning system, and if um, it enables connections to be made between anything that it happens to be uh, linked with by one of these uh, interface things, uh, which is sort of a pathways, if you like. Um, and um, here is the system which uh, uh, enable us to assign some sort of value, to attribute or associate a value with anything it is um, associated with, and it has a lot of connections as you see, um, and it is the effective system which also um, um, uh, is the centre for uh, processing uh, basic emotions, but since uh, basic emotions, um, they may be basic, but they're still rather complex representations, they will have a value in them. So we're going to talk only about the values in this, in I, both parts of this discussion. So we've got now the, uh, the conceptual system and the affective system and the various pathways or interfaces which allow associations to be made between representations of any of these stores and some representation, some meaning representation or value representation sitting in these two sort of stores in the middle. Um, that's how we get some serious inner processing of uh, those perceptual systems. And there are a few more, but I'm only going to mention two now. Um, um, uh, well, um, I'll keep it just for, for a moment. Uh, first, I want to tell you a little a bit about uh, bilingualism, since we're talking about bilingualism. Bilingualism, uh, bilinguals are just a, a kind of multilingual. Uh, they, a bilingual is a multilingual, uh, but um, people who regularly use uh, more than one language can all be uh, called multilinguals. But um, uh, bilingualism is a, is a very uh, a familiar term, and uh, talking about people who know only two languages uh, is a very uh, uh, customary. Uh, and, and much uh, evident, so uh, we will we'll, we will use the word bilingual. In fact, in our examples, we will only use uh, bilinguals, but they're essentially they're types of multilingual. So, what are multilinguals? Uh, they're people who regularly use more than one language. Okay, and to be precise, um, they uh, use these languages, and they may possess uh, um, uh, skill proficiency. Um, in each language in varying degrees. So I'm not talking about the, uh, let's say, the popular or traditional view of a bilingual. Someone who can speak two languages perfectly can be taken as a native speaker in either. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a kind of uh, definition which is regularly um, in play in um, research these days, and that is um, as long as you can use it uh, effect for some effective purpose, for some function, and you use it regularly uh, um, along with the other language that you have to possess, then you are a multilingual or bilingual. Okay, so I promised you uh, a, a few more systems. Uh, only two are coming. Uh, and these are the ones which uh, deal with linguistic processing. Now I'm going to make a distinction between language processing and in actual fact, um, it's quite clear in the framework that language processing involves basically all the systems in the mind, right? So all of them are, are, are involved one way or the other. But linguistic processing is simply that part of the system, of the whole system as a whole, which deals with linguistic structure. And I'm going to assume that there are, in fact, only there are two systems, right? Some people would claim that these two systems. Um, are unnecessary, we can merge them into one system. And it basically depends on your theory. And note that the framework is a framework and it's not a, a fully fledged theory. It allows um, people to uh, ex use it and, and, and cast it in terms of the 
theory that they prefer. In this case it would be the linguistic theory, um, as long as it's compatible with the general architecture of the framework. So, OK, we're going to go with two inner systems concerned specifically with linguistic structure. So these two systems are one, speech or phonology, if you like, and two, syntax or morphosyntax, if you like. And together uh, they could be called grammar, right? the system for which represents grammar. So uh, the speech system, the phonological system, um, is a system that, that by which we can associate with a, a sound representation or a visual representation a phonological structure. We can we can associate, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and of course, depending on your theory, again, you know, you, you put in your the theory that you want. I'm going to deal just with very simple, common um, uh, categories here. I'm not going to go into great detail, but let's say it's to do with syllables, vowels, consonants, and stress, for example. So this is an abstract linguistic structure, which uh, is to do with. Uh, with speech, um, mainly. Uh, it, it can be used also for sign language, but we'll leave that aside for that. So here's an example. Uh, this is believe, and using traditional um, phonological uh, conventions, uh, it's between slashes. So this is believe, uh, written in um, uh, IPA script. Uh, that's 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 uh, if you hear the sound believe coming in through your ears and um, via the representation of those um, uh, uh, acoustic patterns that you picked up, uh, you now have a representation, um, and it's a sound. It's in the auditory system, and uh, when you hear that, um, your mind um, immediately associates with. Um, uh, some phonological structure, some abstract structure in this case, uh, that's what it would be. And secondly, uh, turning to the other system, uh, independent system, we have a syntactic system which uh, uh, associates syntactic structure. So the believe, for example, uh, uh, would be associated um, with the syntactic store uh, in, in, in a particular representations which would be uh, um, syntactic representations and um, uh, they, they can be extremely complex depending on your theory uh, but you know nouns adjectives of a verb plus noun these sorts of things uh, will be um, will, will be activated and, and associated so uh, we now added the these uh, inner the inner systems that we are calling grammar and at this point I should um, really um, point out that this is the grammar that children acquire uh, when they have no ability to read and write, uh, no uh, desire or wish or maybe ability to analyse exactly what they're doing. They do it as it were instinctively or intuitively. That's the mental grammar that arises in, a, in their heads uh, and resulting in, in as a, a, um, you know, um, according to their particular experience it might be. Uh, coping with different languages, but that depends on what comes in through their ears. Okay, so uh, in a multilingual, uh, every word, every instruction, every 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 language, uh, when it is acquired, uh, it is done so using this two these two systems, right? So these two systems cope with any language input. They in fact don't know what language they're dealing with. They simply assign uh, uh, structures to anything that comes their way. Um, I said I would uh, say something about more about grammar, so uh, uh, let's not confuse this grammar, this uh, grammar that uh, children acquire uh, intuitively, uh, with the explicit grammar that we learn about at school um, and if we become students of linguistics it gets very complicated. Um, but this explicit grammar is stored entirely in the form of meaning representations and the conceptual system is uh, the source of all our knowledge uh, that we might call you know, academic or technical knowledge uh, uh, ranging uh, from you know, uh, the, the London tube system uh, to uh, you know, archaeology, uh, 
or all those, all, all that kind of, the kind of, the kind of uh, knowledge that we can talk about, that we can analyse, that we pick up at school. All of this is stored here, uh, and it includes knowledge about language systems. Uh, this is the explicit grammar, so it is quite different from this uh, grammar we were talking about before. Okay. So how does this all work in online processing? I think we need about, uh, need some examples now. Okay, so take for example the sound of the word Stadt. Now the sound of the word Stadt uh, will be a representation in the auditory system um, and it will just be just another sound, a sound along with the sound of uh, um, a bird uh, twittering away in the background or a slamming door or a doorbell um, there won't be anything uh, linguistic about it uh, as a sound, um, but somehow we have to associate this sound, which comes via our ears, with the meaning of town. Okay, um, and, uh, and this, is, of course, is the German for town, um, and uh, the town concept is here stored as a con in the conceptual system. So the root has to somehow link up the sound with the meaning. So let's uh, and, and notice uh, if the same thing is wor um, true of the word town, the sound town. It's no, not a word yet, it's not a linguistic object, it's just a sound. The sound town has to be connected in our bilingual with the same, essentially the same concept. Um, and one thing uh, we know about now is that um, in uh, bilinguals, multilinguals, um, if you operate in one language, if you happen to be using one language, um, all the languages that you happen to know, all the other languages, are activated. So there's no way in which, uh, say, if you're uh, uh, talking German in a German context, uh, that your English is simply resting quietly <coughs> um, inactive. Uh, no, it will automatically be co-activated. This we know and we have to uh, this research uh, is quite clear about this now uh, and we have to uh, explain it within the context of the modular cognition framework because coactivation means competition and this really is the source of our discussion about cognitive effects because if a bilingual um, has both uh, cis, uh, uh, connections um, between sound and meaning activated it means there's a conflict going on. So if you want to speak German, if you intend to speak German, and you have your English activated, uh, there will be obviously a conflict. So this is a conundrum. Okay, so let's kind of just map out in more detail the kind of route that this will take, this, this pathway, this connection. For example, take the word Stadt. Okay. So I'll use the, uh, these four levels which respond to the four systems, the four stores that we were talking about earlier. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, what happens when um, uh, a German hears Stadt, um, or someone who knows German hears Stadt, it will immediately be connect connected to a phonological structure. Uh, in this case, there it is. And this one will uh, be associated with a syntactic structures, um, in this case uh, a noun, for example, in our simple, simplified example, and, and a gender, right, because uh, German is a gender system, it's a, it, there is grammatical gender, as it's called in German, so uh, nouns will automatically have a gender, so this will be activated as well, uh, it's die Stadt, right, it's a, it's a, it's a feminine noun. And uh, the linguistic structure, uh, which we call syntax, um, is then associated with the concept. So what we have here is a schema. A schema is a network of representations which are co-activated together. And it may be built immediately for the first time, the schema, or it may be something that we've been regularly using. Um, in the case of a bilingual, probably, we have been regularly using, so it's well entrenched, this particular schema. Okay, so uh, if we were a monolingual German, that's what would happen, that's the only thing that would happen. But of course we're talking about bilinguals, so we have to talk about what happens with the English system, which is also activated, perversely, even though, technically speaking, it's not needed. Uh, we got 
uh, a link with uh, town, which is the speech structure for this sound, and uh, we link it with a noun. No gender notice because English doesn't have grammatical gender, and uh, this uh, uh, links up with the town. So we have another single schema activated. But of course, um, for a monolingual use, well, that's all we have. But if we talk uh, for bilinguals, uh, English, German, bilingual, both of these are activated. Both these schema are activated, creating, of course, conflict and competition. And conflict and competition is taking place all the time in our mind um, and uh, in our brain. Um, and uh, so uh, it's very good that most of it is subconscious because we probably go mad in the, in the first few seconds of experiencing uh, the, all the terrible competition that's going on in our heads um, as, uh, as, we, uh, as we go through the day. So, uh, okay, so there we have uh, bilingual schemas activated together creating competition. Okay, and moving on to the th final, third and final preliminary discussion, cognitive effects. Cogni what are cognitive effects? Well, uh, people have uh, wondered uh, if it's an advantage to be a bilingual or a disadvantage. And there's been a lot in the uh, research literature recently about potential benefits of uh, multilingualism. Um, so let's just look at uh, the situation as it is. Are there any disadvantages? Well, yes, they certainly are. Uh, bilinguals, for example, will generally have smaller vocabularies in their two languages. Uh, that's natural because they're ex they have to divide up their time uh, being exposed to one language and being exposed to the other one. So naturally uh, smaller vocabularies are developed. Not that you would really see it in proficient bilinguals um, in everyday life. It doesn't appear to be a handicap, um, uh, but you know when you're acquiring it, uh, maybe you will notice it. Bilinguals uh, also experience conflicts in retrieving words or phrases for speech, writing and comprehension because options from one language will always be interfering with the, with the search. Remember, all languages get activated together, so it's not surprising that if you're searching for a word or your mind is searching for a word quickly, um, it may uh, um, get uh, competition from uh, that word, uh, the way you express it in another language. And thirdly, uh, as far as acquisition is, to, uh, uh, is, is, is concerned, um, when children are learning language, uh, their two languages, uh, they will take longer. Uh, uh, their total exposure will probably be uh, uh, to uh, maybe equal or, or different, but in any case uh, uh, they have to be the exposure has to be divided between the two sources of input um, so it's natural that there will be some delays and uh, if you're the parent of a child who is being brought up bilingually you may notice that your child is a little slower than the uh, monolinguals in uh, his or her class um, and start to worry that perhaps you know this is a bad thing uh, having two languages in the house uh, when there's only one language at school and it's causing delays for your dear child uh, but you don't have to worry because they always catch up later uh, and in the end they uh, they do very well. Okay, those are uh, uh, three of the most obvious uh, disadvantages, maybe the only three. Uh, but now look at the uh, let's look at the ad advantages. So well, we we know about all the many cultural and social advantages. I hope I don't have to mention those when you think about it. Um, but uh, they're not cognitive advantages. What about cognitive advantages? So um, let's look at a quote from a paper by Bialystok, Craig, and Luke came out in 2012, and see what their research. Uh, made them come up with. And they say, I quote, um, bilingualism uh, has a much, um, a somewhat muted effect in childhood. Muted effect, that means to say that uh, bilinguals and monolinguals uh, in tests that they can uh, very often do pretty well, both pretty well. You don't see a clear advantage because 
uh, monolinguals at their prime are very good at what they do, um, but uh, when you really start to notice it, it is in uh, older age, um, and um, it seems to protect uh, people. Multilingual, uh, multilingual experience protects against cognitive decline, um, and this is a concept known as cognitive reserve. So when, uh, for example, um, uh, you, you compare monolinguals and bilinguals in um, suffering uh, uh, normal cognitive decline and especially um, um, un, un abnormal cognitive decline, if they have a disease like Alzheimer's, uh, you will notice that um, whereas uh, monolinguals immediately ex uh, show symptoms of the disease as it, uh, as it develops in them, uh, bilinguals uh, may have a delay of about five or six years before uh, the damage, which is quite clear from their brains, if you look at their brain scans, actually appears a symptom. So uh, there are five or six years of um, normal behaviour um, where uh, you would imagine that they had any problems at all. And this seems to be, um, uh, this is called cognitive reserve, some kind of uh, ability to be able to bypass the, very effects, the various effects of a disease and for quite a long time. So just to be clear, this uh, notion of reserve, this cognitive research, which, reserve, which usually um, uh, refers to what you can, um, are able to do uh, in, in your mind, psychologically, uh, and neural reserve um, is something that you note uh, in brain scans of bilinguals which, um, and multilinguals uh, uh, when um, uh, and you don't find it so much in monolinguals. So um, uh, what that means in practice is uh, um, to do with your white and grey matter. Uh, uh, you get the reinforcement of white matter integrity and uh, grey matter volume. There's the, the volume, it tends to shrink in age uh, and you notice that as more reinforced and maintained in bilinguals and multilinguals um, uh, and uh, that distinguishes the two categories, uh, monolinguals and the other category. And uh, looking at the hippocampus, which is involved in, uh, particularly in memory, um, the size and the shape of the hippocampus and other er areas um, are markedly different um, and larger in, um, in people who know more than one language and use more than one language than those who only have one. Um, Whereas, as far as cognitive control is, uh, it's usually expressed as the reinforcement and maintenance of cognitive control. That's an ability, uh, and we'll, we'll see more about that in, in a while. Um, it has to do with flexibility and attention and that kind of thing. So, uh, they, they conclude uh, uh, that a lifelong experience in managing attention uh, um, uh, to two languages uh, reorganizes brain networks, so we have something about uh, cognitive behavior and uh, the, the physical um, consequences, creating a, a more effective basis for executive control, um, how, how you manage to cope with difficult tasks, and sustaining a better cognitive performance throughout the lifespan. And this, we have to say, has to be an advantage. So, um, uh, concentrating now on the positive effects that have been found for uh, multilinguals, uh, how are we going to explain this, um, this kind of reorganization at the mind level and do this in terms of the modular cognition framework? Because the modular cognition framework, if it is anything, it is a way of cre creating and enriching explanations of research data. So, this will all be revealed, or as much as I can give you at the time I'm given. Um, but first I want to warn you, and the warning comes in the second main section of this talk, and the last one in this first part. And it's to do with the notion of a homunculus, and that's everything to do with cognitive control. Okay, so um, throughout the psychological literature, and generally, um, 
we hear words used like strategy, predict, transfer, attempts, supervise, select, uh, when we're talking about the mind or even the brain. And these are dangerous words um, because um, we really should say it's as if the mind is attempting to, it's as if the mind is predicting, it's as if the mind has a strategy, it's as if, as if the mind selects. So all these things are as if words and uh, people who use them usually know that perfectly well but if you go on using them it, the danger is that you get into a mindset uh, and the mindset is called the homunculus fallacy. Um, and this idea is that uh, our subconscious mind and um, all that enormous amount of activity going on in our subconscious mind which can't be uh, kind of controlled uh, by, our, by our conscious mind because we simply don't know about it, we're not aware of it, it's all subconscious uh, means there must be somewhere a system for sort of uh, creating order and uh, preventing chaos. Remember all this conflict and competition going on, there surely must be a sort of supervisory system, a single supervisory system, a bit like if you like the president in sitting in his office in the, while, uh, in the uh, White House. Um, president Truman said, had a notice on his desk saying the bucks stop it's here. So um, uh, that's, uh, and indeed I have been to academic talks where I've seen people talking about a supervisory system um, um, with the uh, implication that it's a single system. So I want to talk about this fallacy a bit. So imagine uh, you have, um, unbeknownst to you as it were, in your subconscious mind, someone, some entity, some person, if you like, so a mind within a mind, uh, which has the job of um, solving all these uh, conflicts and all this competition that's going on. And as it were, is issuing orders, uh, switch to the native language now, uh, because you have two languages active, so I switch to that one, is saying, oh, you're going into a restaurant, um, activate the restaurant network, because that will help you uh, s uh, smoothly um, engage with any task you have uh, when you enter the restaurant. Um, it, it might be saying eat cheesecake, you might be wondering whether you should e eat a cheesecake or not that you come across in a shop um, and it tells you to eat it, it makes the decision, right? It's, it makes the selection. Or uh, you're uh, debating as to whether you should vote for one candidate or another candidate for let's say a president or a prime minister or whatever and um, you're perhaps a bit torn between the two. Um, you maybe have a, an idea of what is the sensible choice but nevertheless you somehow make the other choice and of course it's this homunculus, this mind within a mind um, uh, helping you to make the decision by making the decision for you. But in the modular cognition framework, I'm afraid, none of those systems that I talked about and any of the ones that I haven't talked about, none of these have any precedence, the one over and the other. So they're all, there's, all systems are equal. There is no supervisor. There's no supervisory system as such. So um, these predicting agency, these, the, the only thing we can really say literally is that if what is predicting, what is attempting, what is making strategies, uh, these are, this is only something that our conscious mind can do. So uh, consciously, conscious thinkers can do all these things, but there's nothing in our subconscious mind which is selecting, uh, predicting, attempting or strategizing. So we can safely put uh, that homunculus into the waste paper basket or if you like the trash can. But of course um, that doesn't solve anything throwing it away because clearly we don't want chaos and confusion, we don't want um, conflict and competition to continue without any resolution. Uh, so how on earth does the mind avoid this if there isn't a single supervisor doing it for us? Well that's going to be all explained in part two. So thank you for the time being and I hope you go on, um, uh, take a breather and come back 
and have a look at what I've got to say in part two.